I want to take a minute and welcome everybody to our first uh, annual Diversity Summit. Uh, we have, I think his, this is um, history in the making. We have all three high schools here as well as um, the early college. Uh, my name is Jackie Rive. I recognize a lot of you from either your elementary, middle, or high school now from the Summer Stand program and Stand, and it's really great to have you here. Um, I was thinking about why we all came together, and, and the most important thing is to realize what we have in common. And I hear kids when I'm going into a school and I'm walking down the hall and they're saying things like, um, she's fat, he's ugly, he's lame, she's um, a lesbian, he's gay, you know, and on and on and on. So I need a volunteer from the audience. Nick, thanks for volunteering. Now, tube of toothpaste. Everybody see? Not a phony tube, a real used tube of pressed toothpaste. All right. Now, I'm going to just put a little bit, and just think as I'm squeezing these, these are all the mean things that people say about one another, and they don't even know each other. Okay, Nick. Now, I hear, oh, I was just kidding. Oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, he knows I'm, 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 I'm just being funny. So what I want you to do, Nick, because this is like, I was just kidding, I want you to put the toothpaste back into the tube. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to go? <laughs> so, thank you. Let's give Nick a great big one. demonstration that I was just kidding doesn't count. When you say those words, they come out of your mouth, it's going to hurt somebody in the heart. So remember that the next time you want to say something like, um, oh, all jocks are stupid, all cheerleaders are flirts, all um, guys on student council are heat, and band heat. Now, I would like to introduce you to someone who is not a geek, the superintendent. Oh, student council, I must be. <laughs> Our superintendent of Dearborn Public Schools, Mr. Brian Whiskey. Thank you, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I thank all of you for being here. And I, I don't know if he was introduced before I got here, but we do have a school board with us, board member Mr. Barry. Thank you for being here. I don't think there's any other. I do appreciate the opportunity for you to be here today, and I hope we have a great learning opportunity. You know, if you've ever been brand new uh, in a school, uh, you know how that feels. If you've ever been teased by someone, you know how that feels, or to be pointed out in some way that you're different and how that impacts people. Um, one only has to look back to things like what happened at Columbine and other schools where bullying really was an issue. So we appreciate you being here today, and hopefully we'll all learn that, yes, there are some things that, about us that may be different. We may come from different backgrounds, but we have a lot more similarities than we do differences. And if we focus on the similarities and help each other be feeling welcome and supported in school, all of us will get more out of school and life. And so I appreciate you being here. And I do challenge you to go back to your schools and take what you've learned here and make a difference in your schools uh, for the kids who need it. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Whiston. And I, I'd like Mr. Berry to stand up because he is our newest member of school board. And I know Fords and people know him, but if you were a Dearborn Lion, you also may know Mr. Berry. And all of the teachers, um, staff members in the room, thank you very much for being here. Uh, for those of you who are sitting down, please stand up and be recognized. 
And we also have our associate superintendent, um, Mr. Ron Gutowski. Okay, without any further ado, I am going to turn the program over to one of my friends who actually planted the seed for this program um, a couple years ago and brought it to my attention this summer, and he really wanted this to happen. And so I'm really proud to introduce Hassan Ozir from Dearborn High School. Hi, I'm Hassan Ozir. Um, we're going to start off with a couple icebreakers. We're going to start off and take 20 minutes for the first one, and then we're going to stop it and then start the second one. Um, on the table, you have uh, pink pieces of paper, which will explain the icebreakers. Okay, the first one we're going to be doing is the individual values. It's the longer one. And you're basically going to start off by going through this list and ranking your, like, your best, your five values, your five most values that you think are crucial to yourself in order from one to five, one being your most valued. And then after a couple minutes of choosing, you're going to discuss amongst your group. And then after 20 minutes, we'll start the second one. So start. All right, so now we're going to do the second icebreaker, which is uh, discussing rumors you heard about your school and what was true and what was false. Not rumors about people in your school. We're not going to get into detail about people, and we're not going to make slanderous remarks, no names, just in general about your school, not about people in your school. Thank you. Yeah, hope you guys had fun with the icebreakers and all went well. Now, um, Jackie is going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm only going to talk for a moment because I would like to get right to our keynote speaker. Um, I've known her for several years. I met her at Dearborn Rotary, and we have children in our school district, or in the Dearborn Public Schools together. And last month, her daughter was in one of my peer mediation trainings. And she's a wonderful role model for all of us. And I would like to introduce you to Judge, the Honorable Judge, Charlene Elder. Um, first of all, I just want to start off by saying thanks for inviting me here. I think it's great that Dearborn Public Schools puts together such nice events for our kids and gets you guys motivated and gives you a chance to meet each other, especially from the three different schools, because we always have that rivalry going on with the three different schools. And it gives you guys a chance to meet each other and see that you're really all the same. And even though you have different things that you may be doing and different friends, at the end of the day, you're all one community. And when you go off to college, people view you as kids from Dearborn, not necessarily kids from Fortson, Dearborn High, or Ethel Ford. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I, too, am a product of Dearborn Public Schools. Um, I attended Salina Elementary, and then I graduated from Fortson High School. So, okay. um, I went on from Fortson to Henry Ford, then University of Michigan Dearborn, and I ended up getting my law degree from the Detroit College of Law. Um, my kids are attending Dearborn Public Schools. Um, they went to that rivalry Bryant Elementary, and now my kids are going to Dearborn High. I have my daughter, Medina Elder, sitting right over there. I know she hates me for saying that. Um, 
And anyways, um, to get to what I want to talk about today, I was appointed as a judge about five years ago by Governor Granholm. And you know, it's a lot of hard work to get an appointment. You have to have been a practicing lawyer for at least five years to get a judicial appointment. And it takes a lot of proving yourself. It's getting out there, networking with people, getting to know different people. Um, you have to have good grades. You have to have the competence level. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to get the appointment. So I was very grateful when I got that phone call and I found out that I was appointed to the bench. And after I was appointed, my chief judge placed me in the family division of the circuit court. And in the family division, I hear all the custody and divorce cases. And I think that I was placed in the family division most likely because I am of Arab descent and probably more likely because I'm Muslim. And people probably wouldn't have known that at the time when I received my appointment because I wasn't wearing my head covering then. So people wouldn't have known either way with a name like Charlene, so it was kind of confusing. But I knew the background, and I think that my chief was aware that it was a much-needed gap in the judicial system because while Wayne County serves over 40 different cities, we have Arab Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Polish Americans, Italian Americans. I mean, the list goes on. And that was one gap that was missing on our bench. We have African American judges, we have Hispanic judges, we have people that speak dual languages across the board, but we had no judges on the bench. And I think that she saw that that was an area that was needed, so she placed me in the family division. And you might be saying, well, what's the big deal? But it is a big deal. Because if you do not understand the community you serve, then you can't very well serve them. And it's very important to understand your community at large, and it's very important for the community to be represented. Because when people come into court, they have to feel that they're being judged by a judiciary that looks like them, sounds like them, eats the same thing they eat, and it gives people a comfort level. Because that's, at the end of the day, you hear it all the time on the news, people picking a jury that they want a jury of their peers. Well, it's not really your peers if people don't look and sound like you. So, you know, every day our society's changing, and I think that we are lucky that we live in this beautiful country. I mean, just last year, we, ere we elected our first African-American president, which I thought was great. <laughs> Long overdue. And then you just look at me. I mean, let's be honest. I don't really look like a typical judge. I mean, you probably expected me to come in either wearing a robe or a suit or looking all stuffy. That's really not my style. And, you know, you really can be yourself. And I think that that's where the world is changing. Everybody has an opportunity to really be themselves, regardless of how you dress or how you look. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of people are confused by my heritage, and they often confuse my ethnicity with my religion. Um, Back before I covered my hair, it was probably about a year and a half ago when I first covered, I was shocked to see the responses in my own courthouse because I assumed working with judges who serve Wayne County and with staff that had seen several people come in with headscarf that they'd pretty much know why I was covered. And I was pretty amazed when my colleagues would tell me, happy holiday, judge. And I said, it's not a holiday. And they thought that it was just a temporary thing for a day or two and I'd be taking it off after a holiday was over. I had to explain to them, no, it's here to stay, and then that created a lot of confusion. And then after that passed, it took them a good couple of months to feel comfortable enough to actually get up the nerve to ask me why I was covered, what do we do this for. And I was really surprised considering that our county I mean, is the largest Arab-American concentration in the United States. I was pretty surprised to see that my own colleagues didn't even understand why women cover or what the point is. A lot of people think our husbands make us do it. Not true. Um, anyway, somebody recently told me that it was nice that I, de that I decided to wear the traditional dress of my homeland. And I said, oh, thanks, because I was born in Detroit. <laughs> and I don't think this is traditional dress, but <laughs> thank you. Um, anyways, it got me thinking that people really don't understand my culture, my religion, and they don't understand other cultures and other religions and where other people come from. And I think it's our obligation to learn to understand one another so that we can respect one another and learn to get along with one another. And it really will take you further in life if you can learn to respect people, especially, especially if you're considering something in the political arena. You really have to know the people you serve. You have to understand everybody and you have to respect everybody. And everybody has different needs and different issues, and it's important to understand these things. Um, I think that when we learn to accept one another, it really unites us and brings us together. And I'm not gonna sit here and preach to you all afternoon. I just wanted to share with you a couple of stories that I see in court. 
um, things that have been happening before me. Um, there are certain things that I see that are not unique to any specific culture or faith, and those are things such as divorce, teenage pregnancy, abortion, drug addiction, domestic violence. Those are things that cross every single race, religion, and ethnicity. It's not specific to any particular group. Everybody goes through it. You might be thinking, not me, oh, we don't have abortion, oh, we don't have this. Yes, you do. I see it. It comes from all your high schools. It comes from all your homes. I see it all. And I've probably seen some of your friends downtown. I've seen everything. So it, don't, it knows no barriers, and you really should get to know everybody that you're dealing with, different families, different groups. There's a lot of things going on in people's homes that you really are unaware of. Um, aside from that, I'll give you some stories that I've seen in court. As a judge on the family division, I do name changes from time to time. And so if someone's unhappy with their name, they can come to me to have their name changed. And I get people of all different races, religions, coming over to change their names all the time. But what I see a lot are people of different ethnic backgrounds come in a lot to change their names because they really want that acceptance and they really want to find a way to fit in. I mean, recently I had a young man in my courtroom. Well, it was prior to me covering my hair. And his name was Muhammad Abdul something. I can't remember what his last name was. And I'm not going to give you his real name anyways. But he came through, and I called his name off, case number, blah, blah, blah. Um, Muhammad Abdul Noor, we'll say. He came forward, and, and he just looked shocked. And he said, boy, nobody has ever pronounced my name correctly other than my mother. And I said, well, maybe that's a sign, and you shouldn't change your name. And he said, no, I, I'm changing my name. I'm having a hard time getting a job. I really think it's my name. I've really got to change my name. So I did his name change for him. And about three months later, I was speaking at another event that he was at. And he came up to me and he said, Judge, I am just in such a mess. I changed my name. You know, it's great on my resume. He said, but I went back home and now my family and my friends calling me a sellout. I don't fit in over there. They're all mad at me. Everyone trying to get me to change my name back. So, you know, those are things that people face. And he ended up, he changed his name because it made him, it was difficult for him to find work. And while he was hoping to gain acceptance from one peer group, he ended up being shunned by another. And I found it very sad for him because there really was no right or wrong answer for him. He really wasn't doing anything wrong. But on the one hand, his family took it as an insult. And on the other hand, he, you know, thought he was doing something to better himself. So it's tough. It's really tough for people. And that's why it's up to people like you to break down those stereotypes and make people feel comfortable with who they are, their given names, whatever they're doing, because we are all the same and it is just a name. Um, I also have to deal with different cultures in respect to them. When you get to know people and get to know different cultures, you'll realize that people with ethnic backgrounds tend to be a little louder than mainstream Americans. They seem like they're yelling, but that's really just how they're talking. Um, I had a couple from Nigeria, and I, and I was just thinking, because I know the judges on my bench now thinking, boy, if they appeared before somebody else. They were standing before me and they were screaming, just screaming at each other, and she did this and he did this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm listening to this whole conversation. I said, you can't cross talk, you have to talk to me. So they were yelling to me. And I just assumed, and notice I said to me, they weren't yelling at me, but they really wanted me to hear loud and clear what each of them did. And you know, it's really important to recognize these differences because if you don't, I may have said, I'm holding you in contempt. You can't talk that way in a courtroom but they really meant no disrespect to me. That was just how they were expressing themselves. And it's really important to understand that about different people in different cultures, or you're gonna end up holding them in contempt of court, throwing them in jail, and they're gonna think, America, ah. Oh. You know, they just get frustrated. So I heard them out, explained to them in a courtroom, this is proper courtroom etiquette, we don't really yell and scream. And they were still yelling and screaming because that's just how they are. But in general, I think that people fear what they don't understand and they were afraid of the courtroom. And sometimes some of my colleagues are afraid of, you know, people that come from different backgrounds. And it's just an understanding and getting to know one another. Um, before I cut, covered my hair, I had an opportunity to view the world through a different set of eyes. Uh, one case that always stands out, and I know Medina's probably thinking, oh, she always tells the story. But anyways, one case that stands out was I was divorcing an African-American couple, and the woman had recently converted to Islam. And she wore traditional, not just the headscarf, she wore a whole long gown. And I'm sure that it freaked her husband out, but believe it or not, that's not why they were divorcing. They had their own separate issues, and he wanted custody of the kids. And his lawyer 
um, his lawyer turned out to be a real big bigot. And he put in his trial brief that she should not have the kids because she was Muslim. No other reason, just that. And when he came to court during the trial, he kept pointing to her and saying, look at her, judge. Look how she's dressed. Just look at her. Would you ever give kids to her? And she's a Muslim. And this is true. I mean, my court is video courtroom, so you can get these tapes and watch them. And I was really shocked. But more shocking was her husband stood up and said, I can't take this. I don't want him to go this route, and I don't have a problem with her religion. We had different issues. It has nothing to do with her religion. And the lawyer felt a little embarrassed, but he still played the religion card. And I think that for that lawyer, I mean, he had, the, the man ended up getting custody because he prevailed on the best interest factors. But I think that for that lawyer, about four months later, I had covered my hair. And when he came in before me, he's an old guy, I saw him take his glasses and take a double look. Like, he was shocked. Oh, my God, what happened here? So, and I know he was highly embarrassed, and we've never talked about it, and believe it or not, I think I'm one of his favorite judges, but I think it taught him a lesson that you can't judge people for how they look, for how they dress. I mean, people are who they are. You don't represent in court that somebody shouldn't get their kids because they're African American, or because they cover their hair, or you don't like what they're wearing today, or they have a nose pierced. Those are not reasons why somebody should not get their kids. And I think that he learned a big lesson, and it was pretty interesting. My staff was shocked through the whole trial. And, you know, my stories can go on forever, but I don't want to bore you. But I see issues with prejudice crossing every culture and every religion. And in our court, we have issues of sexual orientation and preference as well. It's not just issues with religion and cultures. It's with people's sexual orientation, Recently, a judge in our court had um, two lesbian women who adopted a child, and this child is now eight or nine years old, and they're having a major custody battle. And Michigan doesn't recognize same-sex marriages. Well, they're not married either, but they don't recognize that, so there's a big issue with the custody because one woman adopted, and the child now knows both of these women as mom, and we're talking eight or nine years later, and it just creates a big issue in our legal system. And that is something that we have to be sensitive about and something that we have to respect and something that now this judge is dealing with because you know it's a big case. It's been on the news the last couple of nights. And it's something she's going to have to deal with. And I think whatever she decides, and even if she decides that both of these parents should be involved in this girl's life, the Supreme Court may say this other woman has no rights because she wasn't the one who actually adopted. And they're just issues that we see. And, and I think that as you can make the difference for these kinds of issues as you get older because if you become aware of these things, you can talk about them and you guys can make new legislation to help cross over all of these barriers. And I tell you these stories to build your awareness and your understanding to the fact that the world is large and there's so many things that you'll be exposed to. You'll be learning and, and learning about others and respecting one another are tools that are necessary for success. You need to respect others, and you also need to respect yourself. And respecting yourself brings me to probably not something that's up for today, but something that I feel is really important to say to you guys because it's something that I'm seeing now that you are so involved in computers and phones and you're the heir of technology. I think it's very important that I share with you something that's become very big on the list for kids. Um, I'm seeing more and more students end up on a sex offenders list. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with what that is, but the sex offenders list was generally created for girls that were raped or girls that were sexually active before the age of 16. And any boy who had sexual relations with a girl under the age of 16 could wind up on the sex offenders list. And I know you're thinking, well, you know, big deal, and some of you are abstinent, which is great, and some of you are not. But if you're 15 that boyfriend of yours can end up on a sex offender's list because it is a crime. But that's not where I'm going with this because the sex offender list has now expanded. And if you end up on that list, you end up on that list for life. There's nothing you can do to get off the list. It's something that you stay on forever and ever. And you can't live within 1,000 feet of a school. You won't be able to teach. You'll never be able to coach. Um, you pretty much have to stay away from kids anywhere. People can get on the Internet and look you up and figure out who you are. And there's a very simple way you can get on that list now. Kids are now texting each other pictures of themselves, and they're exposing themselves. I have girls sending pictures of themselves topless, boys sending pictures of themselves in other ways. And 
these are really crimes. And I know it's hard to believe, and you're probably thinking, yeah, right, but you can go Google it. But it is truly a crime, and I have seen one too many kids of my cases wind up on the sex offenders list because they expose themselves. And what's happening is somebody sends a picture of themselves via text, and then next thing you know, that other person is sending that picture to their whole address book. And once you do that, that's like child pornography. And I know you're thinking, oh, that can't be that big of a deal, but it is. And if someone's parent gets a hold of that and takes that to court, you will end up on that sex offenders list. So if you were thinking of a career in education or coaching or anything at all to do with children, pediatrics, you're done. You will never be able to do these things because you will be on that list for life. And then one day when you have kids, they'll look you up on that list. You're going to be that person that's on that list on the Internet. When you, you can go in and put in a zip code, and you can see all the sex offenders in your neighborhood. And people don't know why you're on the list. It won't say so-and-so on the list for texting. No, it just says Michigan Sex Offender Registry, and you're on that list. And I just think that it's really sad that nowadays there are more and more 16, 15, 17-year-old children on that list and, you know, that's something that you need to take care of. And if your friends are sending you text messages like that, you really have to tell them, stop, don't, this is a crime. And even among girlfriends and boyfriends, you think that they're not going to pass it around, but if they send it to even just one person, they could wind up on that list, and it can cause you a really big problem. So be wary of that. You know, I'm not trying to freak you out, but it's the truth. Um, let's see. I kind of deviated from everything I was going to say to you. So let me see what I'm going to... Well, I won't keep you too much. I guess I'll open you up for questions, but I just wanted to share with you this. Um, if I leave you with anything today, I'd like to leave you with a little tip. Um, and this would be a little piece of advice. Be mindful of a little friend that you all have and you sometimes forget about. It's a little friend that follows you wherever you go. It's like a dog on a leash, sticks to you like crazy glue. It's a friend that sits with you in class. It comes on your university interviews, comes on job interviews, wedding proposals, and other important endeavors that life has to offer you. It's a friend that will be there at every milestone that you try to reach, and a friend that will make all the difference in your success. And that little friend is your reputation. Your reputation will carry you through life. You're already off to a good start. Looks like you're involved with your schools, and you're trying to make the best of things but it never ends. Building that reputation will never end. You have to build your reputation as someone who's competent, someone who is educated, someone that really is going to put forth the effort on your job interviews, in your classrooms. I mean, I tell my kids this all the time. It's your teacher. If you're going to goof around, that's the person that's giving you the grade. So really, everything you do goes back to that reputation. And people will remember your reputation. Because when I look around, I look at all the people that I went to school with. And some have been successful, and some are not. Some are in jail, some are doctors, some are lawyers. Everyone took a different route. But when I look at some of the people that were successful, and I'm looking for a doctor, or I'm looking for a pediatrician for my kids, you better believe I remember what that kid was doing in eighth hour, or sixth hour in the eighth grade or in the ninth grade. And I remember, oh, so-and-so used to cheat in bio. I would never take my kid there. Oh, so-and-so used to do whatever. I would never want them to represent me. So those are things that people really remember, and it stays with you. If you have a reputation for being a big mouth, well, if you want to be a lawyer, people are never going to trust you. If you have a reputation of being a cheater, people are going to look at you as dishonest as well. So you really want to establish your reputation and conduct yourselves with your teachers, your employers, police officers, and others in your community because that's going to reflect who you are, and that's going to have a reflection on your high schools, too. When you leave, people will ask you where you came from, and they'll remember, oh, product of Etzel, product of Dearborn, product of Fortson. You want them to have a positive attitude towards where you came from. So the image you present is the image that the rest of the world will have of your entire community. So make the best of it and enjoy high school. There's nothing you can't do. So just go out and do it. I think that um, Judge Elder is certainly an inspiration to all of us, and we're so glad you were able to be here.